Well, hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight for our very special Books and Ballots, the Intersection of Literacy and Women's Right to Vote virtual event. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Barbara Posinger, and I am the director over at the Sandwich Public Library District. So I'd like to welcome all of you guys here today and a special welcome to Lauren Underwood, our Congresswoman. Thank you for tuning in. But before we officially begin tonight's events, I'd like to take a moment to give due credit and appreciation to the staff whom have worked so diligently, tirelessly, and creatively to put this event together. There were so many moving pieces to this and they were all able to come together and formulate this amazingly structured, flexible event for us. So it's also because of them that we're offered this rare and valuable opportunity. Tonight, we get to utilize our own voices to not only ask imperative questions that are essential to us as individuals and community members, but more importantly, we get to use, those, use this opportunity to ask these questions directly to an established Congresswoman. So thank you. Thank you to Matthew Jones, whom planned this entire event, and thank you to Jessica Garcia Rodriguez, who helped to make sure that notice reached as many people as possible. Thank you guys for working together to give your community this significant opportunity for them to be heard. This event is special. It's truly special in so many different ways. For one, it's an opportunity to honor and celebrate National Voter Registration Day, which happens to be today. This day exemplifies the opportunity for American citizens to have a say in who will lead their communities and districts and their states and nations. And that's no small accomplishment. Moving forward, the celebration Moving, I'm sorry, moving forward, the celebration of National Voter Registration Day would not be nearly as significant without the historic 19th Amendment, which provided women with a voice and a vote for the first time in American history. Furthermore, this event stimulates education and literacy. It stimulates uh, education for governmental structure, the community impact, and accessibility to resources which aid us in learning more about representatives, platforms, and how we as individuals play our own roles in America's democracy. And most significantly, this event provides an open link of communication between you and Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. So a little bit of background on our special guest tonight. Congresswoman Underwood serves the Illinois 14th Congressional District and was sworn into the 116th U.S. Congress on January 3rd of 2019. She is the first woman, the first person of color, and the first millennial to represent her community in Congress. She has an extremely versatile background in community service, including experience serving on the House Committee on Education and Labor, the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, and acts as the Vice Chair of the House Committee on Homeland Security. She also co-founded and co-chairs the Black Maternal Health Caucus alongside Congresswoman Alma Adams, among many other personal, political, and communal endeavors. Congresswoman Underwood, we warmly welcome you to tonight's event. Thank you for taking the time to be part of our library's program, and thank you for providing our community with a voice. We are very grateful, appreciative, and fortunate to have you with us tonight. And so without further ado, I present to all of you, Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. Well, thanks, Barb. Hi, everybody. I'm so <laughs> glad to be with you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm grateful to the Sandwich Public Library for inviting me to, to join this really important discussion. As you may know, this year marks the 100th anniversary since the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which stated that, quote, the rights of citizens in the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex, which meant that women could no longer be denied access to the ballot box because of their gender. This right was not easily won. Women spent years fighting for the right to vote and for their voices to be heard. 
suffragists and trailblazers like Susan B. Anthony and Ida B. Wells organized and educated their peers on the value of women that they brought to the voting booth and the opportunities that would open for women if they were able to vote. Without the work of the people who brought about women's suffrage, women's role in government and in civil society today would look completely different. For one, we wouldn't have any women serving on the US Supreme Court. I'm sure many of you spent time this weekend honoring the life and legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we wouldn't have 131 women currently serving in Congress. I'd like to see many more women sworn into Congress in my lifetime. Women's voices are critical to solving problems that stifle our economy today, like ending COVID-19, ensuring affordable health care and affordable child care, and protecting our national security. It's a true honor to be able to celebrate this 100-year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment with you today. But the truth is that the 19th Amendment didn't guarantee all women the right to vote. Women of color still had a long battle ahead of them. Women of color and people of color faced countless barriers to voting, including literacy tests, poll taxes, and predatory practices at the polls. These practices were finally put to a stop with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This means that voters of color have been denied access to the polls for 45 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment. Only recently has the work and the stories of African-American suffragists like Mary Ann Shad Carey, Harriet Fortin Pervis, and Sarah Parker Redman, and organizations like the National Association of Colored Women and the Women's Convention on the National Baptist Convention been highlighted as a part of the women's suffrage movement. The Library of Congress has profiled some of the leaders of this movement in their exhibit, quote, it's, um, it's called More Than a Movement, and I highly recommend that you check it out. It's virtual, so you can find it on their website. The right to vote itself opened doors for women, but, that, but women could do, I'm sorry, but what women could do with their vote is what truly changed the course of the nation. Voting allowed women to affect change on a number of social issues. Suffrage allowed women access to more equal marriages and improved divorce and property rights. Voting is our civic duty, and it's of the utmost importance to maintain our representative democracy. It also feels quite fitting that this event is hosted by the Sandwich Public Library because libraries are central to our democracy, sometimes quite literally. Libraries host polling locations, voter registration drives, and community forums. And most importantly, they give access to high quality information and resources for no cost at all. Libraries created the dem democratization of information, which has been key to so much of our nation's progress. I personally hold incredible value for reading and being a lifelong learner. I spent countless hours reading growing up and read every book I could get my hands on. I even used to read the newspapers that were dropped off at my house. It was like a competition. I had to get it first while the pages were crisp <laughs> and unruffled. Those readings uh, changed as I got older and I not only read for fun, but for school and work, including textbooks and articles and medical journals. This reading provided me the information and background I needed to be successful in school and at work. I read a lot now as my role as a Congresswoman more than any other period in my life. I read daily briefings from my staff and memos from the committees I sit on and letters and emails from our constituents. And it's essential that I read daily and use what I've learned to make informed decisions on behalf of our community. Literacy is vital to my life and all of yours. It was vital for the women's suffrage movement. And I'm so excited to continue to celebrate with you tonight. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments, Congresswoman Underwood. Uh, what a pleasure to hear from you. Um, yeah, we're, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, we're gonna ask Dalen to join us and she will introduce herself and she'll kick off our Q&A. Uh, welcome, Dalen. Hi, Daylin. Hi, I'm Daylin Johnson. I'm from Samanac and I'm a freshman at Aurora University. I'm double majoring in professional writing and English. 
and I want to thank you for taking our questions. Sure. First one we have is, what made you so passionate about politics? Well, when I was in high school, the mayor of Naperville set up uh, a program that let high school students serve on local boards and commissions. And so I applied my junior year and got appointed to a one-year term on a Fair Housing Commission in the city of Naperville. And literally, our job was to, you know, take in complaints and, you know, allegations of discrimination and investigate them and make recommendations to city council about how to make improvements. And I loved it. I was, like, curious and had all types of questions and really felt like I was making a difference in our community. So my senior year, I reapplied and got another one-year appointment. And when I finished high school, I had, like, this really rich experience in local government for being, you know, 17 years old. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but I had, I had the bug, that public service bug, which is a little different than just like politics. Um, but I was, you know, on a path that I didn't know was going to lead to the Congress, obviously. Um, but I really liked the idea of serving our community, making a difference and being a regular person doing that work, right? I didn't have to walk in the door being an expert on this, but I had values that I shared with my community. And we said that we were welcoming and tolerant and open to everybody. So like, let's make sure in fact that that was the case. And um, I was hooked ever since. All right, our next one is how has COVID-19 impacted your work? Well, COVID-19 has changed everything about our work. I'm in Washington, D.C. right now. Um, this is the second week that we've been here in September, but usually I'm at home doing these kind of Zoom calls, connecting with constituents all across the 14th district, you know, holding committee meetings on video teleconference and, and you know, doing our committee work, you know, passing legislation through committee or whatever. And it's so different because, you know, all of 2019, we were out and about throughout the community. We did, you know, 15 in-person town halls. We did all these office hours. We would have mobile office hours in Sandwich every month. Um, I think it was at the library, I think. Okay, yeah. And, you know, just being able to show up and engage people in person. Like, I miss people. <laughs> And, you know, hearing directly from folks, it just, it changes everything about the job. Um, and obviously, there's so many issues because p case rates are still rising. First responders and healthcare professionals and other essential and frontline workers don't have all the personal protective equipment that they need even now. Um, you know, there's so many families that are facing economic distress, whether it's they can't afford their mortgage or their rent or newly hungry, right? Like we talk to the folks at the Northern Illinois Food Bank, they tell us that demand is up 50% over this time last year. And it's all types of people who just never imagined that they would be facing this type of need. Um, and so that's why I'm working so hard on getting this next COVID package um, negotiated because our community needs the help um, you know, all these students and students like you um, in, in school, you know, a, a lot of students, I don't know if you're on campus or if you're virtual, but it, it's just a really tough environment for early childhood and K-12 education and higher ed. And, and it's just, it's a bad situation. And so this is something that we just continue to work on nonstop, um, being here for our community, trying to solve problems and deliver resources. Thank you. Our next one is Sandwich is a very small town. What are your plans to aid small towns in the race against climate change? And how will you help manage public transportation, renewable energy, and more? Yeah, so you know, the thing about climate change is it impacts all of us, right? We've certainly seen the effects of climate change in our community with the extreme weather events, the heavy precipitation that's, you know, prevented our farmers, you know, it rained every day in the spring of 2019, for example. And so, you know, so many of our farmers were not able to plant their crops, um, which has a real economic impact on our community. Our economy can't be strong if our rural economy is not strong in the 14th district. Um, you know, we see the increase in emerging infectious diseases as birds and bugs and other vectors change their migration patterns because of cl changing climate, right? New diseases get introduced to our communities. Um, and we have to have solutions that communities of all sizes can implement. So, you know, one thing that we talk a lot about is having, you know, like a clean energy economy by 2050. And it's like, well, what does that mean? 
one of the things I was really struck by is there's a community in McHenry County that I represent, it's called Huntley. And the Huntley School District has installed solar panels so that over the next 20 years, they're gonna be on 100% renewable energy as a result of these solar panels, but they're making the investment now, right? We've seen Kendall County government, I don't know what part of, um, well, I guess Samanac, you guys might be in DeKalb County, um, but okay, but Summer Sandwich is in Kendall County and Kendall County government has been investing in solar energy too. And this is like really important because we have to take these steps now if we're gonna have any hope of mitigating and hopefully reversing some of these impacts that we see happening. I've been doing a lot of work on the healthcare impacts on climate change and trying to restore resources and like the availability of expertise to help coach communities like ours on steps that we can take to prevent public health impacts of climate change. Because right now, the only agency that we had doing that work, um, their budget has been cut and their staff have been reassigned. And that's no way um, to face what is truly an existential threat. So I think that communities of all sizes throughout the 14th districts and across the country stand to gain as we make these investments in the federal level in clean and renewable energy sources, whether we're talking about infrastructure investments, which is huge, in you know, DeKalb County and in Kendall County and in Somnock and Sandwich, right? Like we have a lot of work we need to do um, to improve our infrastructure. Uh, and if we can do that to create green jobs, even better um, using renewable materials, for example, I mean, even better. Um, and, you know, I think that we have to help communities set their own plans, right? So it can't just be a federal initiative. Right, we have to have state level and community level uh, support and buy-in and where we're planning. And so, you know, I hope that folks who care about this issue um, reach out to our office um, and let us know the opportunities that you see in your community, because we want to make sure that that's reflected in our work in Congress, um, because it's definitely in, in process. And um, we love that kind of feedback from the community. What do you see as some next steps in the journey toward equality for women? And are there any that you can, we can take here in Sandwich and across our congressional district? Well, you know, I, I saw that question and I was kind of like, mm, I wonder what you think. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think that there is a way to go, right? Like I'm the first woman to represent this community in Congress. And, you know, it's 2020. And I think that like we should not be having these firsts anymore, but it's like women belong in all places. Women belong at decision-making tables, right? Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that there'll be enough women on the Supreme Court when there's nine justices. And, you know, it's one thing to say it, and then it's another thing to like look at, well, how would we even make that happen? And you see that the federal judiciary doesn't have parity or you know, equal number of men and women. You look at the number of women in Congress, there are more women serving in Congress right now. And we're like not even at 25% of the Congress. And so you know, I think the opportunities, especially for leadership in the 14th are significant. Um, and you know, it's not a preparation issue. And it's not a qualification issue. And it's not like there's a lack of expertise or you know, people just don't care or whatever. Um, so there's definitely like barriers, but it has nothing to do with the women, okay? We just need to be recruiting and encouraging each other, not waiting for someone to ask you, but like to volunteer and say, you know, I have ideas and just go for it. Um, and outside of you know, public service, I do think that we have a long way to go for women in STEM, for example. In my congressional office in DC, I have this wall of women in STEM. And, you know, it's this like constant um, push to get young girls, uh, teenage girls interested in these kind of careers. Um, but the more role models that we can have that you know, or in each of our communities like we have in the 14th, I think then we'll create those pipelines for women in the sciences and even STEAM, right? So not to be exclusive to all of our arts friends um, because we need uh, gender parity there too. But I do think that there's a way to go, but in the 14th, we have a lot of talented, high capacity boss women. And um, 
you know, I'm excited to see what everybody, including you, decides to do. Many of us have role models and leaders who inspire us as young people. Who did you look up to as a young woman? Oh my God. Okay, so when I was eight, so I grew up in Naperville. And um, there were two women, you know, when I was in elementary school, who I would see on TV every day. One was Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah was on not just once a day, she was on twice a day. And I loved that she was less than an hour away. I felt like she was like mine, you know, like I would just have my time with Oprah <laughs> and watch it as like a young, young person, watch her and, and admired her, but it didn't seem that far away. And it didn't seem like she was untouchable or unreachable. And I've never met her, but you know, I just felt kind of like I related to her because of the geography. And then the other was Senator Carol Mosley Braun. So Senator Mosley Braun was the first black woman to ever serve in the Senate. Kamala Harris is only the second. Um, and so, you know, again, she looked like me. She was on the news every day. She was the most powerful black woman in America and she was mine. You know, she's my senator. And so I grew up during like this really formative time with these icons, in my opinion, who had achieved like the heights of influence and power, but also like represented me. And so they didn't feel unreachable or in, in like some glass box, you know, someplace like really far away. And um, I think that certainly changed my perspective on what I could achieve um, because I had them as role models as a young girl. What wisdom would you give to young people, especially young women who are reluctant to participate in public life because they don't feel there is any space for them at the table? Oh my gosh, okay. So, you know, here's the deal. People make decisions about our lives every day. What we learn in school, you know, what we eat, like the materials, the, the clothes that we wear because all these trade agreements, right? All that stuff is being decided for us and not in this, some kind of conspiracy theory way. I'm not, I'm not trying to go there. I'm just saying, you know, we are consumers. Um, we are voters. We are smart. We have ideas and opinions and we talk about these issues amongst ourselves all the time all the time in our group chats, on our social pages, right? We're tagging stuff and, you know, DMing it or whatever. And, you know, putting it like our little TikTok videos, like y'all, first of all, I may not have these Snapchat accounts or the TikTok, but I see them because my staff does. And I think it's brilliant. And if you're consuming the information and you're sharing the information and you have these like gut reactions about what you're seeing happening in our country, what you're seeing happening in our community. My thing is, why not participate? Why not be that decision maker? Um, you said you're 19? I'm 18. You're 18. Okay, well, great. You can vote. You can serve on your county board. You can serve on your city council. Uh, and you pay taxes if you have a job. <laughs> And so, you know, your perspective is as valid as anybody else's. And so I guess what I would say is don't discount your point of view. When I was a young, young woman, I always thought that like, I wasn't enough. I wasn't smart enough. I hadn't achieved enough. I didn't have the right job title. Um, you know, it was like this whole thing. Well, if only I get this internship or if only I can get a letter of recommendation from this person, or if only I get promoted, then, you know, I'll be ready. And like, that's like the wrong mindset because you are more than enough as you are right now today. And guess what? Our community is desperate for your leadership. They want to hear your voice. They want to know what you think. I'm in rooms all the time with, you know, seniors, middle-aged folks who are concerned about our community and the direction of our country. And they'll say, is there any hope of getting the young people involved? And I'm like, are you kidding? Young people are so engaged, but it's in like this, it's sort of in a silo. 
because the conversation, I'm going to say we, even though, you know, you probably think that I'm old, <laughs> that we have amongst ourselves doesn't always spill into, you know, the community conversation. And I think that we need to invite those folks in um, and share some of our reflections with them. Um, because you have incredible leadership and expertise, and we need you at those decision-making tables. And listen, if folks don't want to make room, you got to be like Shirley Chisholm, the queen, okay, and bring your own folding chair and scoot it right up to that table and say, can I be recognized? And, and say your piece. Can you tell us about any projects you're working in Congress that excite you? Oh man, so much is going on. But uh, one of the things that, you know, I think is really important is making sure that um, we are saving mom's lives. So in the United States, we have a disparity in what's called maternal mortality. So women dying as a result of childbirth or pregnancy related complication within a year after delivery. And in our country, black women are three to four times more likely to die. But in Illinois, they're six times more likely to die than white women. And these are largely preventable deaths. And it's been like this my entire lifetime, and I'm 33. There's not been a federal initiative or any kind of nationwide thing to try to save mom's lives. And so um, got together and started a caucus with a colleague from North Carolina and introduced a comprehensive set of legislation. It's called the Momnibus, M-O-M-N-I-B-U-S, to address issues like women veterans who have health care coverage through the VA that still have this disparity, right? Incarcerated women, um, increasing the number of health care providers, so like doctors and midwives and doulas. And that's important in communities like Sandwich because we know in Kendall County, there's no hospital in the whole county. And so there's limited options and choices for all women. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, we aren't seeing moms die because of these kind of preventable issues. So, um, you know, using technology. So during COVID, right, we've seen more use of telehealth, for example, right? You can log into a platform like this and basically chat with your provider. Well, that's cute if you have broadband. But if you don't, there's a whole lot of people that can't get uh, the care that they need during this time, right? And so those are the kind of issues that we're tackling. Um, interventions that help all moms, but with a real clear lens to trying to end this disparity. Um, because I believe in 2020 in the United States of America, the richest country in the world, that we shouldn't have our moms dying related to childbirth. And we've made a lot of great progress. And so I'm excited. All right. What is Congress doing to ensure that all citizens have access to voting without regard to gender or race? Yes. So in the United States of America, again, citizens now have the right to vote. But the Voting Rights Act that I talked about in my remarks has been um, jeopardized, that Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so we have a bill, H.R. 4. I don't know if the chat um, Ashley from my team is watching. Ashley, if you can put the fact sheet for HR4 in the chat for everybody watching so that people can see what that legislation does. It is critical to securing the right to vote um, because we've seen some states, um, you know, systematically disenfranchise voters. Um, you know, there's basically modern day voter suppression tactics that happen. Um, and I believe that we shouldn't be making it more difficult for people to participate in our democracy, mm -hmm. uh, putting up these barriers and things like that. And so I would encourage everybody to take a look at the fact sheet link that's gonna be in the chat. Um, and if you're excited about it, you can reach out to somebody in the Senate, pick a Senator. And if they're not one of our senators, you can go analog, take out mm -hmm. a piece of paper and an envelope and put a stamp on it. Okay, and send it in because the Postal Service is still around and it's still reliable and your mail will get delivered, um, but you can let them know how important that legislation is for you. Are there any similarities between nursing and serving in Congress? And if so, what are they? And how did your nursing experience prepare you in Congress? Yes. 
So um, very, very, very early on in nursing school, we had to learn how to walk into a patient's room and establish trust, right? Because the relationship between the nurse and the patient doesn't work if they don't trust you. Um, and you usually don't have a lot of time in that initial introduction. You like, you may have like three or four minutes. Um, and so we had to learn and like practice how to connect with people and, you know, how to talk to people <laughs> in a way that like cuts through the noise so that you can like look into their eyes and like make this connection or bond. And it ends up being like kind of an intimate exchange because they're really vulnerable. They need help. And you're like, I am here to help me tell, help you tell me how I can help you. What do you need? What can I do? Um, this job is the same way. And I was so surprised but people come to me or my office when they really need help, right? We are not usually people's first call. They call us when they have tried everything that they can think of. And then they're like, well, I'll just call Congresswoman Underwood. Maybe she can do something. But expectations are really low and people don't know. And then you could just like hear it. Now it's all by phone, right? And you can like hear it in their voice. Um, and I'm really, I'm really honored to be able to help our community in this way. I didn't think that it would, you know, feel the same, um, but, you know, we've been able to help on so many different issues, whether it's like passports and getting people who've been stranded overseas during COVID back to be reunited with their families, um, you know, tax issues with the IRS and getting these refunds, um, or people who are owed social security back payments, like real money, like, $40,000 or $50,000, like money that changes people's lives. And it's not always about money, but, you know, we can just help them when, you know, they've not been able to get through. And, you know, it's really rewarding. How have you seen communities of faith effectively lead positive change in communities forward toward like racial equality or racial equality? Yes. So faith communities have been, um, you know, really essential uh, to our progress as a nation. Um, and, you know, everything from like the Freedom Rides and what was it, like the Southern Baptist leadership, Southern, Southern Baptist something. Um, and so historically, right, just played such an important role in the civil rights movement. Um, but what I will say is at this time, you know, where especially where people are reluctant to be what they would call like political, Right, you sort of seen faith communities take one of two tacks. One is like activists, you know, we are pro one, two, three, four, and we're gonna fight, and here's all the things that you could do as a congregation, right? And this is gonna be this thing that we do together. And then others have been like, oh no, we're not political. Everybody's welcome here. Please don't bring that in. And I just encourage all groups, um, whether they're faith communities or even like neighborhood associations or whatever, to have these conversations. You know, if, if, if it's not a diverse community, well, why is that, right? What can we do to be more inclusive, to welcome more people in? You know, how can we learn more about our neighbors, people who don't share our faith? Um, you know, what can we work on together as we get to know each other? How can we serve this community together? Um, and I think that as faith communities view their role as leaders in the community in a broad and expansive sense um, that, you know, we're going to continue to see this conversation around equity and justice, you know, move forward. Um, but those principles, right, because these are values, equity is a value, justice is a value, it's not limited to any one religion or spiritual practice. It's not limited to any one race or ethnicity. It's something that unites all of us as our community. And so there should be an openness and willingness to have that conversation across the board. All right. Lastly, I have, what is your favorite book, movie, TV show, or music? Okay. So there's this book. It's called All the Single Ladies by Rebecca Traister. And that book literally changed my life. I read it when I was about to turn 30 and I was on this long plane ride, it was like 15 hours. And it was about these revolutionary women who throughout history had defied gender norms, right? So either passively, cause like life happens or actively declined offers of marriage because they were making a change and doing really meaningful work 
and their communities. And I found it to be like really just inspirational, um, not because I was a single lady, but because I was young and didn't know, you know, what was going to be next for me. I was wrapping up my time in the Obama administration and felt like, you know how you sort of get a sense that like something big is going to come? You know, and you don't know what it is, but you just like sort of get this sense. That's how I was feeling. And I was like kind of unsettled about it. And then I read this book and I was like, girl, you are not alone. Ladies have been out here crushing it for centuries and our history just hadn't been told. And so I felt like, you know, one of my girlfriends just basically wrote a book about all the girlfriends in history and I loved it. So um, I would recommend that book to anybody who needs a little pep talk. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it has been really meaningful for me in my life. All the Single Ladies by Rebecca Traister. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Underwood, for joining us tonight. And thank you, Matthew. Time. Thank you, Dalen. Thank you, Barb. Hi, Jessica. I didn't talk to you, but thank you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got some other remarks from local leaders. And um, if you need to drop out, Congresswoman, we again say thank you so much for, for being here and for all you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um, we now have the privilege of hearing from some other folks from our own community on this topic of literacy and uh, the 19th Amendment, women's right to vote. And um, so I'm going to welcome Allison Kurtz. Uh, uh, to share with us. Hi, um, I'm the library media specialist at Sandwich High School here in town. Um, and in today's technology driven environment where social media can be used to rapidly present, modify and spread ideas to a large audience, it's more important than ever for our citizens to be vigilant and even skeptical of everything they read and hear. Information literacy, the concept of being able to select, organize, and evaluate information and its sources is a crucial skill that helps to navigate the digital world. It's a skill that researchers and scientists have always honed in order to find the truth behind what they are studying. Today, it's a skill that all voting Americans have a responsibility to develop and use to help make the decisions that will influence our country. We celebrate the brave women in history today who fought for their right to vote because they, along with those who fought for civil rights for all people throughout our history, did the hard work of ensuring greater voting equality. It would be a greater honor to their memories to take the responsibility of voting seriously by earnestly learning to evaluate the information we are bombarded with daily on the internet and 24 hour news channels. The true power of information literacy comes not in the ability to use reliable sources to disprove an idea that is contrary to our own, but in the ability to critically evaluate the sources of information that we believe support our own opinions. This is why it's so important for political discussions to continue on a large scale, but for those discussions to be led by an informed electorate that has studied every side of an issue. It begins with educating our children through strong library media curricula programs within our schools. When children begin learning basic information literacy skills in the school library, like how to use a nonfiction book or how to evaluate a source, they can continue to develop those skills throughout their education. For adults, it's important to get involved in programming at our public libraries to help expand our knowledge and abilities in information literacy. I joke with my students when we begin research by telling them that the way to do research is in the name. You research and then you search again and search again until you have found information on every aspect of your topic. To be able to explain all sides of an issue is key for understanding it and your own opinion on it, as well as understanding others' opinions. When we vote, we should vote knowing that we completely understand the issues and the reasonings behind the different stances on those issues. It's the only way we can truly make informed decisions affecting our nation. The women of the suffrage movement made great sacrifices and took bold steps in order for women of today to have a voice. It's our responsibility to make that voice an educated one for the betterment of society. We all need to continue to take advantage of the services that school and public libraries offer so we can make informed decisions when we step into the voting booth. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. 
And now we're going to hear um, uh, from Jessica, who will read a statement for us. Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica, and I am the Marketing and Outreach Specialist at Sandwich Public Library. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be reading a statement from uh, local city councilwoman. Her name is Kara Kelly. hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> okay, and um, okay, she starts with, one of my fondest memories of early school days was the day of my first grade class took a walk to the Sandwich Public Library. This was not the first time I was at the library because my sisters and I walked there with my mother fairly often. But that day, my entire class was signing up to get our very own library cards. It was a short walk from Woodbury School. We walked up the steep stairs and opened the huge door. There we uh, were met by Miss Newton, a most cheerful lady with her large friendly collie dog. We, we went up to the main desk and stood um, to the side at the dog, as I'm sorry, as the dog slept on the rug in front of the desk. Uh, when it was my turn, I turned to Miss Newton, my name, give me a second here, when I, when I was my turn, I told Mrs. Newton, my name was Kara Rosentretter. We had a little chat about how she knew my family. She knew to, to whom I belonged because everyone knew everyone in Sandwich in the 1950s. It was so exciting to think I would be able to have my very own library card like my older brother and sister. I was so proud of that card, and I loved the library and the world of reading that was opened up for me that day in our small town called Sandwich, Illinois. And her um, statement for voting, um, when my siblings and I were young, my parents were actively involved in the, w, in the VFW and the VFW Auxiliary. My father served in World War II in the Coast Guard, and we heard stories how his tour of duty in Hawaii was cleaning up beaches after the attack of Pearl Harbor. My mother, having been raised in Chicago, taught us respect for all people regardless of skin color. This was a gift to me as I witnessed white only and colored only signs at drinking fountains in department stores in Chicago when we visited my grandparents there. My mom would use those experiences to tell us children that that was not okay. Love of God in our country was instilled in me with our family involvement in the community and church. Along with that came a duty to serve others. Getting out to vote was always easy for my mom since she never drove a car. wasn't e I'm sorry, wasn't always easy for my mom since she never drove a car and would need to get a ride or walk or walk to the polling place. But even when her health failed, she somehow got out and vote, voted. Prior to the 1960 Nixon-Kennedy election, my father was a precinct chairman for the De Democratic Party. I remember signs and buttons gather, gathered in the den of our home. We didn't talk much about party in our home, mostly about the right person for the job. More importantly, the responsibility to express our thoughts and the right to vote. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, I just want to take a moment here and, and offer thanks, and then I've got some good information to share with everyone. I just want to start by, again, thanking Congresswoman Underwood and everyone at her office, uh, specifically Ashley and Landon, who uh, worked to uh, organize with us and to help uh, work out for Congresswoman Underwood to be with us. Um, also, thank you, uh, Barb, for all your support as Jessica and I worked on this program and uh, we appreciate all that you did to make tonight possible. And then I wanna say thank you again to Allison um, for your wonderful comments and uh, for participating here tonight. Uh, thank you also to um, Councilwoman Kara Killey for the comments that you sent. Thank you, Jessica, for reading those. Um, and thank you, Daylin, for joining us and, and uh, moderating our Q&A. Uh, a great privilege to have our questions answered by our Congresswoman. So thanks for leading in that regard. I wanna share before we wrap up a little bit of information um, as we celebrate uh, tonight, both literacy and the 19th amendment. Um, I wanna share a little bit of information about uh, our library here at Sandwich and what you might need in order to get a library card. And so that not only are you informed, but as you talk to other people in our community, 
you can share that with them as well. So in order to get a library card here, you need a um, photo ID with your current address and a piece of first class mail that verifies that address. It also could be a vehicle registration or a voter registration card with your address on it. So you bring those items in and that gets you access not only to all of these beautiful books behind me, um, but to all kinds of resources online. Um, our newest one that we have here is called Canopy and you can find information about that online, but it is a streaming service with um, movies and uh, documentaries and educational films um, that you can access for free. So we're always finding new kinds of ways to share information with our community. And so your library card really is very valuable. Um, as far as voter registration goes, um, today is voter registration today, which actually was a happy accident. It seems like we were so clever in choosing today, but um, I did not realize when we chose the state that that would work out. Uh, but we're having our own voter registration day here at the library, and that will be Thursday, October 1st. And that is the day that if you would like, you can call the library and make an appointment to meet with Laurie, who is our voter registrar. And um, I wanna share a couple of resources with you also. I'm gonna share my screen so that you can see a couple websites that might be helpful for you. Um, this is a website here, vote.org, um, and all of this is on our website links. This is a website you can go and find out if you're registered to vote in case you don't know. Um, and as it says, it only takes 30 seconds. Um, so who doesn't have 30 seconds to spare? And then also another resource that you can find on our website is uh, the online voter application. So if you're not able to come in person to vote, uh, to register to vote here at the library, you can do so online. Again, that information can be found um, on our website if you go to adult and events, and then you can see um, here where uh, you can find those documents as well as information of what you need in order to uh, register to vote when you come. Uh, so feel free to call us and set up a time to register to vote. That's the information I wanna share with you. And so once again, I wanna thank everyone for participating tonight and just say what an honor it was to take a moment. There's a lot going on in our community and um, around the world right now. Uh, so it felt really good to pause and to celebrate and to uh, be thankful for um, not only literacy, but for the 19th Amendment. And we look forward to the next steps as we continue journeying together towards greater equality for all of our community. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we hope to see you real soon at another library program. Good night, everyone. Yay. Bye-bye.